Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, today we have a kind of a global event. Um, Elizabeth de Mariafi, the author of the brand new book, The Retreat, is joining us from Newfoundland. Um, and let's see here, Maria Hummel, a brand new book, A Lesson in Red. And you're joining us from Vermont, correct? Correct, yeah. All right, well, Barbara and I are both in Arizona, but we're just at different locations. <laughs> I'm here at the bookstore at the Mothership, and Barbara's at her, uh, her home office. And um, for those of you watching, I will be monitoring the Facebook comments uh, field. So if you have questions for Elizabeth or Maria, please don't be shy. Put them in the comments field at any time during the program, and I'll reemerge from, uh, from the shadows uh, about 45 minutes in to ask any questions you might have. So Barbara, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Not only is this an international event, but we're gonna visit the arts because we're gonna be talking ballet and we're gonna be talking art in an art museum. Um, so that'll be that'll be different from serial killers, <laughs> the sort of dark things that we often wind up talking about. So I'm really pleased about that. Elizabeth's book, The Retreat, um, does involve a, uh, it's kind of a, uh, not a locked room mystery, it's really more of an Agatha Christie style closed room mystery at High Water Center for the Arts and lots to do with ballet. And those of you who are paying attention to our calendar will know that Megan Abbott has a new book coming out also in the world of ballet. And Tasha Alexandra, who has studied ballet, is going to be talking to her. So, um, I took ballet lessons when I was a kid. I don't know if it ever did me a whole lot of good, but it's exciting to, to venture into that world. And it's a world filled with a lot of pain, isn't it, Elizabeth, and determination. You can't easily be a ballerina without a lot of physical and mental toughness. Absolutely. I mean, there's you have to be driven by so much ambition, and I think ambition that will override the uh, the physical exhaustion and the, and the competition. Um, you know, especially as you move into into professional dance, absolutely. Right. So it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts about why you chose this particular background. I've often thought that looking at ballerinas' feet was a pretty excruciating experience. Um, are you a dancer yourself? I am not a dancer. Um, I have a couple of friends who uh, have both um, been part of professional dance in one way or another, one of whom runs her own company, which is what my character Maeve wants to do. Um, but I am a lifelong long distance runner. And I think I was able to sort of bring some of that physicality and that sort of drive and, and then all the like aches and pains, <laughs> I think from, from that experience. Wonderful. There have been some some confessional kinds of books about ballerinas lately. I'm trying to remember. I think there's a new memoir by someone um, who's counted that there's a lot that goes on in the world of ballet besides, you know, the gorgeous dancing and the beautiful costumes. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Maria, my sister was a real star in the art world. She was the associate director of the Museum of Modern Art um, up until she had retired from illness and then died. So I have spent my whole life in art museums. My husband's grandfather founded the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, formerly the Rosenwald Museum. So I really enjoyed your, um, your art museum in Los Angeles, right? And mm -hmm. um, I thought Still Lives, which was a Reese, I never can say this word right, Reese Witherspoon. Why do I have trouble with this name? Reese. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon, Hello Sunshine Book Club selection. I thought Still Lives was terrific. And I was just saying to Maria before we started that I was sorry that we didn't connect when she published that book. But happily, um, Lesson in Red is a, um, a sequel. It carries on from what happened to characters, you know, those who survived, um, in Still Lives. And it has a lot to do with the role of patrons as well as the role of artists and um, museum administration, which is a complicated world and full of big personalities and lots of emotions and big money oftentimes. So ladies, you probably have talked to each other. Would you prefer just to chat uh, or I, you know, I sort of kicked us off, but since, um, why don't we do this alphabetically? So why don't we talk to you first? Here, I can figure this out. There we go. The retreat. So carry us into the world of ballet. And Maria, I'll just sort of sit back and let you ask questions and whatever you like, and then we'll switch. 
Okay, that sounds great. Well, I have always um, wanted to go to Banff, and so I was inspired to read your Crime Reads um, article about um, that trip to that art colony and going there with your story idea and then what happened and how it got shaped by your experience. And I just wondered if you could talk a, a little bit about that. Um, you know, your expectations of the artist colony and then and then also what you encountered with that landscape and how that fed into writing the retreat. Sure. Um, so so in the retreat, um, there's a professional, so my character Maeve is a professional dancer who has recently come out of a difficult marriage and she's a single mother now and she has to leave her two kids at home. Um, and she has sort of reached a point in her dance career um, for a variety of reasons where uh, being a professional dancer, certainly being, um, uh, being the highlight professional dancer in a company is not going to happen for her anymore. And she's decided that what she's going to do is uh, start her own company and be her own artistic director. Um, so she goes uh, to a Banff-like place, <laughs> is how I describe it. Um, but uh, I had an experience that was that was not unlike Maeve's, you know, around at around the same age where uh, I also was a single mother. I had just come out of a marriage. Um, I was in the early stages um, of my writing career, and I really didn't want to lose momentum. Um, and I was so worried. I had uh, just recently finished an MFA, and I was extremely worried that I was going to come out of the MFA and then get so caught up in um, just like the life stuff of you know making sure my children were cared for and the mortgage was paid. Um, so I I signed up to go to Banff for this two week writers program. Um, and I went in October, actually. Maeve goes a little bit later on in the season. Uh, but even in October, winter came in really early, um, earlier, you know, and even people there went, oh, this is really weird. <laughs> but uh, but it was like going down to minus 20 at night. Um, and this is, you know, uh, 12 years ago, I guess, that I went, almost 12 years ago now. Um, so a lot of those... Uh, I guess, visceral or atmospheric experiences that Maeve has in terms of the weather changing all the time and uh, and the presence of the animals. And, and so, you know, Banff is a really big place. The, the, um, the center that I imagined, High Water Center for the Arts, I imagine it is somewhat smaller, um, but it doesn't even matter how big Banff is because you can stick all this stuff in there and all this sort of human, um, conceit and human made interest in, you know, creating things and you're still, you know, kind of in this bowl of the mountains and there's deer and elk and bears and, and you're constantly being warned about not, you know, so you're in the mountains, but please don't go for a walk by yourself, um, this sort of thing. Um, and in, in some ways, like if you, in some areas um, at Banff, you can actually walk into rooms where the facility has been built around the intrusion of the rock face. So to me, this was so interesting when I was at Banff, this sense of, um, you think you're going to the top of a mountain, but you're not really, right? And I think in the book, I describe it as sitting inside a crown with these jeweled peaks all around you. Um, so actually you feel quite small um, and you feel somewhat oppressed. Um, the days can be quite short because, uh, you know, because there's the mountain is kind of blocking the sun on both sides. Uh, so I got really interested in that feeling of um, this pressure of uh, physical pressure of nature all around you. And at the same time, everyone who's going there is going um, for a select amount of time with this highly ambitious project and it's competitive to get in it's competitive to get funding to get in and um and you get there and um and my experience and i think uh you see a little bit of this in the book is that we all got there and for two days we're like this is amazing i'm going to meet all these other artists and i'm gonna like uh you have all this collaboration and interesting discussion and after about 48 hours everyone goes <gasps> but I'm only here for 11 more days. And now I have to produce this great piece of work I said I would, I would produce. So not only do you have this, the pressure of, um, you know, of this sort of physical world, but I think also the, the pressure of, the, of the, the art world, of the, the world for creative people who are, uh, you know, often trying to cram a creative life into, um, 
uh, into you know all their regular stuff. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, you. I think you. I haven't been to to Banff, but I've been to another writer's artist colony, and you captured that exactly. And I feel like not only is there the pressure to make something, but there's sort of a perf perf pressure to perform like you're doing really well at making something. You know, like there there is this sort of, um, you know, you're in sort of this enclosed hive of people, and you have to show that you're looking really busy or or successful at what you're doing. And I I feel like that came out in the in the book. Um, I just want to, before I ask my next question, I just want to ask Barbara, because you used, you said locked room versus closed room um, mystery. What, like technically, what's the difference? Just that closed room means you can leave? Is well, that... yeah, a, a locked room mystery is basically an impossible crime. It's set up so that um, whatever the crime is, the space was so sealed that um, there's no, you know, it's, it's particularly difficult to work out how the crime was committed. Um, a closed circle is basically, it's kind of an Agatha Christie setup, or it's Rebecca by Du Maurier, where mm -hmm. Andrew Lee, the house, you know, encloses the action, or it could be the village uh, that Miss Marple does, or it could be a ship, or it could be a theater, or whatever. So, um, the, the, the um, technical construction of a, of a regular mystery means that you have a crime committed in a circle of suspects and you have a detective who is either present or summoned, whichever way it goes. And there's a limited number of people who could have done the crime because, you know, it'd be, it would be ridiculous to try to interview a, a universe of suspects. So somehow or other, you have to kind of contain the landscape. And people often say locked room incorrectly. And in this case, it, it is not. It is a, the artist colony is that, that Christie closed up thing. And I was fascinated to hear you say that because I have spent weeks of my life at the Bay Springs Hotel. And my <laughs> experience of Banff is just totally different, but let's not go down there. However, <laughs> you are right about the animals because one of the things I've always most enjoyed in the swim out pool is that an elk will be attracted by the hot, humid air and it will come down and it will just lay down by the pool <laughs> in the middle of all the bathers and we all sort of work around it. And then they go out on the golf course, which closes in the middle of October. And they come down from the mountains and the stags get up on the greens and they fight each other for mating privileges. And you can hear the, you know, the way the antlers clash. It sounds like um, somebody is playing a, you know, uh, some kind of instrument or sticks or something. And you can hear them from a very long distance. So I have walked the golf course and, you know, watched these guys do all this. What part of Banff were you in? Um, so uh, the Banff Springs Hotel is right in town, like right, right on the Bow River. It's a beautiful hotel. And, uh, and whenever we're there, we walk down and have a drink. <laughs> um, and wow. if you go a little bit further up the mountain, there's quite a big facility called the Banff Center for the, the I think it's now called the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity. Okay. So it's, it's set up almost like, um, like I think it's referred to as a campus almost uh, with a couple of larger buildings that um, house artists. So, you know, you might have an entire dance company go um, and spend three weeks working on development and practice. And then there's also these little, um, what's called the Leighton Colony, which are these very special little cabins that are all very individual. One of them looks like a boat and they are out in the woods. So you can um, you can sort of sign up for a program that houses you sort of within one of these residences, which are really beautiful, um, or you can actually sign up and also take a cabin um, where you're not allowed to sleep at night, which is exactly the way the cabins are in the retreat, um, but that you have this private space that you can go to, um, to work um, on whatever it is you're working on. Right. Well, no, I, I asked because obviously the tourist experience is going to be different than the experience that you went for. And, you know, Banff is a very famous, well-known place. You know, the Rocky Mountaineer will take you from Vancouver to Banff and all. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, it's just above the town. So it's, it's about a 10 minute walk into town. Um, and that would be a walk that, you know, you would commonly, you know, be bumping into deer. Um, 
lots of bear warning signs. I was there in the fall, um, as Maeve is, um, on her retreat when it was elk rutting season, which you just described, uh, to, you know, so the, the males fight, but also once they have those mating privileges, the elk are really, really dangerous. So you never want to get in between a male and a female, any of the female elks. Um, so we were warned, like, a lot. <laughs> wow. uh, not, not even so much about bears, but about not getting in the way of the elk. Um, which I just think is like metaphorically really, really interesting that we think about big predators as being the big danger, but in fact, humans have no place there. And we can't just sort of stumble through the forest because there's a whole order there that, that, that we're not. Absolutely aware of. true. There are herds of cows over on the oh, side yeah. of the female elk and you have to avoid them. But Maria, back to your question, your art museum functions as uh, that closed environment, particularly in still lives, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I wanted to get the terminology right because I was thinking of locked room when I was thinking about Elizabeth's novel, but I I see the distinction now, and I'm I'm wondering one of the things I thought was great about the retreat was um, I was really guessing to the end, um, you know, who was the real threat in the story, and um, and that seems to me like the biggest challenge of this kind of book, right? Because you have only a few people and obviously you have the threat from the of, from nature happening um, too. But I, I wanted to know if you, in your process, how you wrestled with that particular aspect of the plotting, the, this idea of, of not giving away kind of who you were gonna reveal at the end or what you were gonna reveal at the end. Yeah, that's a really good question, because I feel like the book really changed over time as I was writing it so that um, to me, there's like there's two settings in the book, there's inside and outside, and each of them have their dangers. And so part of uh, my guiding force in it was for Maeve to always having to be questioning her own instincts and her own self as to where is the dangerous place? Is it more dangerous to stay inside with the humans or outside? Um, with sort of monstrous nature where there's this storm and 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 everything is disoriented by it um when i originally conceived of the novel i imagined it as much more of a cat and mouse thriller um which would have removed i think that last minute question of who is the you know who who is really the the threat um and then as you know, we were working on it um, myself and, and, and with my editors who were both really smart, um, it just became obvious that it was gonna be much more interesting because it's really about, the story's really about Maeve um, mm -hmm. and her experience in the world and, and her um, experience as someone who's come through actually, has already come through a lot of difficulty, has already come through um, um, a lot of trauma before she gets here. Um, so in order to do that properly, it was actually much more interesting to create this uh, more fulsome cast of characters. Um, having said that, I mean, I love Rebecca. Um, I probably have read Rebecca more than any other um, book in this genre um, over time, but I also really love And Then There Were None. And so, you know, once I sort of had my cast of characters and I figured out how I wanted to do it, that was very much the feeling that I wanted to get from it. Um, and what I love about And Then There Were None, um, which I think does both the closed room and the locked room, you know what I mean? Because... Um, it, it's, it's in a way, there are a lot of people who have used and then there were none as a template over the last year or two. A yeah. surprising number of books have, um, you know, <laughs> Agatha Christie was was really, um, it's just astonishing how many plots she created that have been used subsequently. If you think about it, you know, Gone Girl, this whole trust no one genre, it really is the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Mm -hmm. She was the pioneer, you know, in the trust no one narrator. And certainly, and then there were none, which had a horrible title, you know, when it was first published, which I shouldn't repeat here <laughs> on Zoom. But more than um, one terrible title, actually. <laughs> really terrible title. It's actually had two. I think this is the third official yeah. title, if I if I recall that right. But yeah, I mean, it is an impossible crime in the sense that you know, it's only at the end that it's revealed how how the whole yeah. thing worked. Um, and but it's also a closed situation in that you know you only have so many people on the island or so many people in your art center exactly right and i think that that looking at the art center in the mountains as a kind of island 
um, unto yeah. itself, which is very much how it feels when you're there, you know, because you are like weirdly removed. And so even when we do walk down into town, like it's kind of, it's, you know, now you're living in this place that is sort of halfway between, you know, being among the animals and being a regular person, <laughs> right? So, because you're so focused on, on, on your project and what you're doing. So, um, yeah, so I really thought about it and then there were none a lot and I really enjoyed that piece of it. Um, what I think is so interesting, and I totally agree, there's been a number of books that have sort of um, followed this template. And I think it's so weirdly prescient, you know, because I started writing this book, obviously long before the pandemic, um, which has provided this bizarre, you know, enclosed, closed room, um, uh, claustrophobic feel for all of us. So it's just interesting to see all these books getting released now. I wonder if I was thinking also it's weirdly a climate change narrative too. We're all sort of stuck on the closed room of the world. And, uh, and, and, you know, there, I, and I did feel that way that in your book, that was one thing that I think distinguishes it is that there is this huge external, I mean, there's often storms and stuff, but your storms are like real, I mean, there's a real sense of, of isolation and, and danger created by the by the wilderness around them, and um, you know, so so that that duality of the external internal threat is really really cool. Some of the characters notably underestimated too. I mean, there's one I won't name who, you know, um, makes some notably poor decisions. I yeah. think in, in your book uh, to an unnecessary conclusion. Um, you know, didn't need to happen if um, if this character had just given more thought to to the dangers of climate and so forth and you know we had flooding over the weekend here in phoenix it's july when it's normally like 118 and bone dry and it's 86 and raining and the store had to close for two days because we got flooded and oh, wow. you know i know it's just that i think i think we're all used to climatic norms and you know people are dying in seattle because you know we don't need air conditioning you know whatever and now suddenly all of that's, that's changed. Um, well, it, it's all changing so rapidly. It was interesting right. to me because, um, so I live in a, I live in, in St. John's, Newfoundland and we get, a um, St. John's is all about precipitation. So we don't get really bad cold weather here, but we get, when we get it, we get lots of rain, we get lots of snow. Um, so I'm used to getting a couple of big snowstorms a year, um, but, after I'd already written the first draft and we were working on revisions uh, in January 2020, right before the pandemic, we had a storm of the century here um, that actually shut the city down. The city had to declare a state of emergency for uh, seven days. So you weren't allowed to drive on the roads and nothing was open, not even grocery stores, like nothing was open. Um, and it was really uh, fascinating for me as a writer who was working on this book because I watched a lot of the situations um, that, uh, let's say, have uh, have fingers into my story um, actually play out. And a lot of it had to do with, we're so used to climatic normalcy that we are also really used to a lot of modern convenience and we're a lot used to um, a lot of accessibility to things. So for us, you know, um, the grocery store is closing for a whole seven days, you know, Lots of people have a storm kit for two or three days. But after that, you know, you could see the sort of the domino effect of first the, the very most vulnerable people in society are going to run out of food really soon because some people live day to day, right? So if stores aren't open, you see that happen really fast. And then, you know, how it would sort of, um, you know, move down. And when stores finally did open, it was like craziness. Like there was like, I mean, lineups, you know, literally, uh, like a like a snail shell in the in the parking lot of people waiting to get in. Um, so I mean, as a writer, yeah, it confirmed a lot of things for me um, in a kind of a crazy way to the point where I would actually like I, during that week I kept thinking, God, did I do this somehow? Like, have I been thinking about this somehow so much that I manifested it? Yeah. Did you lose power too? Um, some people lost power for days. Uh, we lost power briefly, but uh, where I live is, I think we're always trying to figure out we're either on a hospital grid or on 
the main police station grid. We can't figure out exactly how it is that we always luck out. We usually only, I think we only lost power for eight or 10 hours, but there were people who were out of power for days, yeah. So Maria, that's a real California experience with the fires and the rolling brownouts and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, you know, it's become much more difficult to predict how life will work um, because we're all, we're all used to a constant flow of electricity. I don't know, you know, how how we're going to manage if that gets totally. I didn't, never used to believe in apocalyptic novels, but now I can see that if the electric grid, if the electric grid really went down for a considerable period, that you could get to apocalypse in a big hurry for an awful lot of people. It'd be wild. So, Maria, let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, and I was talking. I talked yesterday to. Um, Samantha Downing and Megan Miranda, and we were talking about campus mysteries. And, you know, an art museum in its way is not that different um, than, you know, a Donna Tartan sort of book where you, you know, have put yourself in a, in a place where um, you've got a lot of hierarchy, you've got a lot of fighting for status, you've got, in some cases, a lot of money, which makes people feel uh, display entitlement uh, to people who are really powerless against that. Um, are you? How did you sort of get into this world of, of of Los Angeles, which is an interesting place anyway for an art museum? Uh, what inspired you to write Still Lives? Yeah, so Still Lives. I worked at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA um, for four to five years. Um, I was the writer editor there, so I did a lot of work directly with artists interviewing them and then you know writing up things for our magazine and for the galleries and stuff um and uh and so i i at that time thought oh this place is the perfect backdrop for you know a, a mystery of some kind because the passions run so high because there's money involved because there's all the things you said earlier you know there's there's so much there's glamour there's intrigue there's money there's desperate people there's you know people who have strong moral purpose but that might get twisted the wrong way you know all that kind of stuff so um so that's where um where still lives came out of and and while i was working there i thought of some of the twists that would later be in the book although i didn't write it for many years i think i needed some time um to percolate away from the selfhood and stuff that um you know maggie's not maggie richter the main character who's a copy editor at the museum isn't a hundred percent based on me but she's got some some percentages of me in there um and i and i think i needed to be able to see myself from a different phase of life um and then lesson in red actually is a campus novel it, it's not set uh, um, entirely on a campus, but I wanted to switch the lens from the art museum um, to the art school because I think it's a it's a really high stakes setting, um, kind of an, a stretched version of the artist colony that Elizabeth was talking about, where you have two years to do all that sort of proving yourself, you know. And there's people coming in from all over the place, but usually at a much more tender. Um, age or relationship to their craft. So they're, they're very um, excited, very nervous, um, full of anticipation for what these two years could bring or sometimes three. Um, and I'm talking more about the graduate school experience a little bit than the undergrad one. Um, and and they're, it's high stakes because a lot of schools, um, particularly some of the ones in California that I was basing this on are, are really expensive. So you, and they don't necessarily give that much funding. So you're, you're making this really high stakes kind of claim to a future that might not happen. And I was just really interested in how those relationships, you know, the relationship between sort of teacher and student or you know the the different hierarchies of the school are an evolution of hierarchical relationships in in art history of master and apprentice and muse and um but they're very you know they they also lead to um you know different dangers for people i think personally financially you know um in terms of their psyche so uh yeah 
it it's it, it, I do think we're in a, an interesting campus novel phase too. There's there's definitely yes. some out right now, um, like the Maidens, which I haven't yet read. And we're we're um, I think almost exactly twenty years from the publication of a secret of the secret history, uh, which is interesting to see the evolution from that uh, book too. Well, I, I agree. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, going back to golden age novels were written, many of them by academics, if you, you know, Dorothy Sayers being an example. Um, and they were campus mysteries, but in kind of a different way, although Gaudi Night is certainly um, that that kind of a, of a story. Um, and the power imbalances are, are so severe in both your cases. Um, and also, you know, it's really hard for people, creative people, to go to a place where somebody, where they may be just sort of ordinary, and it turns out other people are really brilliant. I was thinking back to the movie Amadeus. I remember going to opening, well, I don't think it was opening night, but shortly afterward on Broadway and just being blown away. Mozart's my favorite composer. Yeah, and I'd never even heard of Salieri, but you know, I could understand the sort of corrosiveness of you know, what it would be like to be just a sort of pedestrian composer and then you're up against a one draft. I mean, you know, Mozart, if you look at his manuscripts, which I've done many years at the Morgan Library and so forth, they're a one draft manuscript. He never even corrected a note. You know, he obviously heard it and, you know, and just put it down in a way that almost no other composer's ever been able to do. And how awful it would be to run up against that, you know, to, to, to know that you would never attain that level of, of genius. You know, what would that do to you? And, and yeah. especially if you're in a place where, you know, you're there to, to foster your creative talents. And, you know, I mean, it's just like great dancers. I mean, you know, not everybody could be Nureyev or Bershnikov or, you know, um, some of the, the great Margot Fontaine or whatever. What if you were just an ordinary ballerina? Which mm -hmm. means you're better than most people, but <laughs> you're not extraordinary like they are. What would happen to you, you know, in if you're in that that position where mm -hmm. you know you can't ever be the equal of, you know, somebody? And I think that for so many artists, and I, I really felt this um, in your books, Maria, that uh, there's like a dual stakes that are at play. And I think you've already touched on it a little bit, but so not only are you competing on this level, this artistic level, but um, there's so... Uh, there's so much investment that has to go into an artistic career and the possibility of actually um you know being financially independent within that artistic career uh you know is is tenuous at best and you know so certainly in the visual art world relies so much on collectors and patrons um and people with a lot of money and then you go to an art school and there's this automatic inequality between the professors and the students and exactly the way you you describe it with you know a, a long history of masters and apprentices and 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 how that really makes one group of people much more vulnerable vulnerable to the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it, in, it, it's, it's like we're, we're in an, an, an American experiment, which I think is, is in one way amazing, which is it used to be to become an artist, there were, you know, you'd have to find a patron or you'd have to, you know, go move to a city and kind of live in a tenement for a while till you, you know, somehow sold some work. And, it, and now there's this sort of like you can get a ticket kind of to go somewhere, you know, with partial scholarship or just an acceptance and people will call you an artist um, and they will give you those two years of time, whether it's through loans or through, but it it's, um, so I think it's opened up the possibility for more people to choose art as a potential career. But then on the other hand, these MFA programs graduate, you know, thousands and thousands of people every year and how many of them are actually going to make a viable living as an artist and how two years isn't very long. Like it's not long enough for anybody to really develop their craft. So uh, only the geniuses, you know, do do. And sometimes they have, you know, personal problems. Um, so they, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so I think, and that was something, so my, the character who's, this isn't giving anything away, the, the Brene Brazil, the character who's kind of at the heart of this story, the enigmatic character who was found shot 
dead in her studio by her own gun. And, you know, some people think there's more to the story. You know, she's the figure of that genius, you know, like somebody who seems to, to have gotten it all together in terms of her, you know, being able to kind of position herself as a student to, to break out. But then on once you start looking more closely, you see she's a first generation college student, you know, the, the something that, you know, really struck me from my time working at Stanford was that people who are first generation college students just are out, out of, you know, fish out of water compared to the students who've been groomed there, you know, by, but, you know, their whole lives by elite programs and stuff. And, and it's, it's very hard. It's like a very, very challenging experience. So I wanted to reflect some of that in the story. Can I ask you a strictly craft question? Because I'm so fascinated by sequels. Yeah. <laughs> um, when did you know right away that you were writing? Um, and I think that you're thinking of this as a trilogy, if we're lucky. Um, yeah. Did you know right away that you were writing a trilogy? Did you come into it like that? Or did you start writing and start to feel like there was there was you know more story? No, I, I, I don't know. At what point in the first draft I decided I was probably going to write three, but I had this idea that I wanted to do that because I wanted to see how um, I didn't feel well, I felt like I wanted to to shift the lens on this, this art world, you know, LA art world, California art world. And I, I you know, just one book wasn't going to be enough. So art museum, art school, and then hopefully artists colony, not <laughs> resembling yours at all. Um, and uh, and uh, um, so, no, I, I did have the sense that it would it would grow from this story. It is still um, I've I've found to be amazingly difficult, um, more so than I think I anticipated because the mystery structure is so defined in some ways. And so it has a little bit, bit less malleability than some other structures for a middle novel. Um, but but I did want to do that. Yeah. Plus, if it's a sequel, you're stuck with all the things that you put into the first book. Yeah. You did your world building, basically, in book one. And then you have to carry it forward. So it, it's a it's a bit different. I wanted to ask you about trendiness because you think, I mean, I do anyway. I'm, I'm actually a Stanford graduate. And when I was there, which was a long time ago, um, there was a very great difference between Northern and Southern California. San Francisco was in a completely different city than Los Angeles. So I still think of LA as, you know, very trendy and, and Oftentimes, what might be successful in the art world is not necessarily even good art. You know, it just happens to get catch a train, so to speak, um, of something going by. Whereas the ballet world, or you know, is a much more classical world. Um, you know, I mean, there there are differences, obviously, but there's a classical tradition that I think is hard to to break through. So, do you think Maria is part of your? You know, are you are you? Do you think the trendiness of LA is, you know, one of the engines that drives your story? Well, I I guess I would I would tease out sort of two aspects of trendiness. One is is kind of a future forward or a um, uh, what's next kind of attitude, which I think is pervasive in LA and and actually kind of delightful in a lot of ways. Um, and then there's the other sort of thing that LA gets accused of, which is is superficiality or you know an attention to appearances. Um, I personally think that LA, um, yes, there was a there was a performative kind of showy aspect to to some LA art that got famous. But on the other hand, because it had cheap studio space. Um, because it had places where people could afford to live and artists could afford to live as opposed to New York in a lot of ways and opposed to San Francisco, it's changed somewhat. I feel like it had a really vibrant um, art culture simply because it was a place where people could live and make work um, and and they could make it you know, not earning that much money themselves. Now, I think it's shifted a lot now that downtown has gotten so, I mean, the extremes in downtown have 
have both gone up like the homelessness and the and the um and the high end aspects of it and i think that's filtered out through lots of the city but I, I I don't know. I did like poking fun at some of the superficiality in still lives um, because it, it is, you know, it is interesting to have so many conversations with people about their facelifts and stuff like that. Um, but but it, uh, on the other hand, I, I felt like I met people in L.A. who were just true originals in so many ways that would have a hard time. There's more conformity in other cities sometimes. And LA is one of those places where people can be whatever they want. And uh, and it leads to some really, you know, interesting original um, self-presentation and and uh, and also work. So I, I don't know. I, I, are you, I guess I would, love to turn this to a dance question because i'm curious about you know mave's relationship to her work and wh where you sort of like if you could imagine where she's going to go from this book in terms of her work and stuff do you see her um changing what she's making it seemed like she was kind of hinting i don't know i don't want you to give too much away either but um I think what I was really getting at with Maeve was how much her identity was, uh, you know, her identity was wrapped up in what she did creatively, which I think is true for everyone who, who has a creative career for sure. And it, it's harder to separate, you know, who I am from what I do. Um, and with dance so much more so because the physical body is, uh, is, deeply implicated you know with that's all there is to it so for Maeve who's 34 who's um who uh has had uh what is a really normal uh or normalized for better or for worse uh operation um for most women she's had an emergency c-section for you know as i said we we've kind of normalized this but for a dancer that's a career ender um and uh, because those core muscles can't be recovered uh to the extent that she would need them to be. So I think she's facing down age at an earlier age than, than most women need to. Um, and she's facing her physical identity as her professional identity, as her creative identity all at once. Um, so to me, that was why dance was gonna be so important to, to that character. Um, and I think, you know, there's, I think we have a, a cultural sense of uh, the ballerina. You know, I watched Black Swan a number of times while I was, um, while I was writing this book, um, just because I so enjoyed the psychological aspect, um, the, in, the, the depths to which that character um, is uh, so much in her own head. And she's, you know, um, in, in some ways her own enemy, right? So I just thought to me, that was gonna be really interesting that we have this sort of superficial, again, kind of sense of the ballerina as just being pretty. Um, but uh, but actually like, I, so in the book, I continually, Maeve uses the word athlete to, uh, to describe herself because of course that's what she is. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um. I'm trying to think. I had some other questions for Elizabeth. Let me just look at my notes here. I guess I, I, I'm, something I've been thinking about with with writing, you know, books that are about fear, you know, or or that have fear as as a, a major component, is that I I'm always trying to zero in on what about my character scares me, right? Like not, it, you know, my central character, the one that I want readers to side with the one that I side with and I'm curious what like what scares you about Maeve like what what about her um maybe it's not something she becomes or but 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 could become or or I don't know did you have any thoughts on that that's an interesting question I mean I think for Maeve she's got this single-minded drive around uh around dance um, and around her own physicality and her own creativity, that if she was able to apply that to everything else in her life, she would be completely unstoppable. 
Um, she's also uh, come out of a situation where she's have lived for many years with a kind of terrible gaslighting. Um, so her her difficult marriage, um, as I phrase it, was um, uh, with her artistic director. So somebody who really was very controlling, controlled her professional life, controlled her personal life. Um, and it's really messed her up. Um, and that takes a long time to recover from. So, so she's in this place where, you know, I kept sort of looking at her and going, wow, this is someone who can physically just take on so much. And at the same time is always second guessing herself is always going, but are my perceptions actually accurate? You know, um, is this, uh, you know, are, uh, can I actually trust my own instincts? Because I've been told for so long that I can't be. So to me, that was really, that's really scary. And I think that's really scary for women, right? That you have somebody who's, you know, deeply successful, highly ambitious, highly proficient, who is still like kind of, you know, has been trained to undercut, undercut, undercut. And that her big challenge is to, to really figure that out. She has to figure herself out in order to, to, uh, to save herself. Um, and, and on that note, <laughs> um, and I, it's really hard to talk about um, either, of your books, Maria, because there is a sequel situation. So whenever I want to like phrase a question about Lesson in Red, I'm like, oh, but this could potentially ruin still lives for someone. Um, but I was super interested in notions of the male gaze in visual art because, uh, you know, there's lots of different suspects. And um, so I was really interested in how much, how much were you thinking about that and playing? I mean, certainly, you know, um, in Still Lives, the, the focus of the uh, very imaginative art project that is the center of the novel is about uh, rescinding that uh, in, I think, the deepest way. So I'm just interested in how, how, how you were thinking about that when you were writing the books. Yeah, I think I wasn't thinking so much about writing against the male gaze, but just really, I mean, both books came to me as, a, in this series and and pro and really the third as well, although I'm not really into plotting that one yet, as images of artworks. So the first one being this um, and still lives the the um, artist who goes missing in the first chapter. Her opening her exhibition is of of herself. She's she does basically self portraits of of herself as famous murdered women and through an, an intense kind of layered artistic process. And in um, Lesson in Red, I had the image of, you know, a projection in the desert, a woman like larger than life eating cereal with a loaded gun. And like, who is that person? Why is she there? You know, and, and knowing when you're watching that, that that woman has all has died. Um, and I, I think that I, what I wanted to do in both of those cases was just climb into the story through the female gaze and, and not have, or have the, male, the, the female gaze kind of turning inside out our, our, you know, obsession with sensationalizing violence against women, um, turning inside out our, rep, our constant representation of it of the dead body, you know, the dead female body and, and having these artists who, 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 you know, literally, yeah, like sort of show the seams and, and turn the garment inside out. Um, and, and I think that, you know, similar to, to Maeve, when you were talking about Maeve, what I was thinking about what, her, about her scares me a little bit is that she seems so devoted to her work and to becoming the very best version of dancer that she becomes that she almost stops believing she almost signs up to have someone else tell her how to do it and is willing to kind of let her artistic director husband choose for her um that because she maybe doesn't believe she could do it herself but she's so willing to put her art forward that she's even willing to like live in this bad relationship mm -hmm. uh, and i think for for Brene brazil and kim lord who are the artists um there's, you know, I'm interested in, uh, you know, the extremity of, of women's desire to create and how, you know, as, as a culture, I think we, we distrust it a little bit, um, you know, 
that there's something sort of cool about being the the guy artist who you know rolls themselves in a barrel down the street you know down dangerous steps but a, a little unsettling about women doing it um and you know i think it's still a question i'm sorting out in the books because i may also be falling prey or or at least you know falling myself falling into that pothole finding myself falling into that pothole of you know is this okay um to to be that extreme as an artist mm -hmm. uh, yeah so. so i need to call patrick up from the deep before we run out of time but i would also say this that there's there's a real difference in in your books in the sense that you know the ballerina her body is is the art you know and it's inevitably going to let her down. I mean, you know, there are a lot of very few really old ballerinas because your body just wears out. And so she has a time pressure about, you know, you've already pointed it out that experiences have, have made it impossible for her to go one way and now she's choosing another. Whereas an artist, you know, can paint. Um, there are a lot of old artists, you know, who can yeah. either sculpt or paint. Mm -hmm. So it's a really different thing if your body is the canvas as compared to mm -hmm. canvas. Um, in terms of career expectations and longevity and, you know, ticking clocks and all those kinds of things, which Maeve has to face. It really is a ticking clock for her. Um, which, Absolutely, yeah. You know, and plus she's, it's, you know, she's also an abuse survivor, which um, ate up a lot of the time she had on the clock. So, you know, there's a lot of resentment there um, would inevitably be. I, find, I mean, I just think it's really interesting the way both of you have gone into lives of creative people um, in, you know, using the mystery or the thriller format, which is incredibly expensive. Patrick, where are you? I need, come on, Shakespeare time. Come out, Caliban or Ariel, wherever you are. I'm here. Yeah. Um, no, fascinating discussion. Um, Let's see, there aren't a whole lot of specific questions, but Anne has a question for uh, Maria. She says, um, I love books with an art theme. Still Lives, Still Lives sounds like a perfect title for your first book. Did you choose it? Just wondering. There are a few other books out there with the same or similar titles. Did that concern you at all? Yeah, yeah, I know. There's Louise Penny and, um, and other ones. I think, uh, I decided to title it that title very early on because that was the name of the exhibition in the book and the name that the artist gave her work. And, you know, I like the the double entendre possibility of still lives, still lives. Um, there are, yeah, it, it's hard with titling. I think that you sometimes think you have a really original title and then something comes out that is very similar to yours and you're just sort of stuck with the fact that you came up with the same cool title at the, at, as someone else at the same time. So I don't, I don't worry about it too much. Um, and uh, I wanted something, I was really hoping for, I wanted to go for a spondy, you know, in poetry, that's the double stressed, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a double stress and it, and it's very, um, it's very eye-catching for people to see double stress. So Got Milk is an example from marketing. Um, so I, I stuck with it. I liked it as a title. Titles aren't copyrightable either. So, I mean, you could have, you know, 400 books called Still Lives um, yeah. and then figure out how to differentiate them. I think your covers have been, um, you know, very, look at how colorful this is. Whereas I think Elizabeth's, I mean, do I have, yep. Um, this is a much darker cover, more in keeping, you know, with the atmosphere yeah. that you have in your book. And it's always fascinating to me to see multiple cover ideas, you know, because usually there are. You probably got to see at least two or three from your publisher before they settled on this one. And, you know, I mean, it's a written book. And then somebody has to translate that into some sort of physical representation. And over the years, Patrick and I can both attest to the fact that covers are the thing that often rile our authors the most. They either really like their covers or they really hate them, <laughs> you know, um, or they wish they had more input or whatever it is. But covers are, are surprisingly controversial. Still Lives um, and The Retreat, they have that, that sound of permanence about them. They don't seem rooted in any particular moment. 
you know, whereas if you had the girl with the still life, <laughs> so, that's so 2014, man. Um, uh, let's see here. Anne has a good a question here for Elizabeth. She meant, she says, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned that you had begun writing your book long before the pandemic. Uh, how long did it take you to write it? Um, I think I started uh, writing in 2018. Um, that's when, uh, when my last book came out and I feel like uh, I was tied up with a few other projects. So I probably started, yeah, I would say probably fall of 2018. And um, it usually takes me about a year to get a full draft of a novel. Um, and which I don't know if that's slow or faster. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, and then at that point, you know, um, I sort of, I'm, I'm, I try to keep things pretty close to my chest until I have a really, at least until I'm really close <laughs> to, uh, to an ending. Um, so yeah, so we weren't, uh, I didn't start working with an editor until um, probably fall of 2019. And then, as I said, you know, uh, when the snowstorm came, we were still working on revision. So it was very timely for me. Hmm. We inevitably have questions about, uh, you know, from aspiring writers. Um, can you both talk a little bit about your, about your writing process and how you get the, how you get the words done and what's your, what's your routine? Maria, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, I do, I do believe in routine. I don't always, I'm not always able to accomplish it because I'm a, a mother and have a, a professor job too. But, but that is, I think, if you're starting out or if you're even just a couple years into it, routine is probably the very best solution to making progress than that, that I can think of. Um, one piece of advice that I saw once in The Guardian, it was, you know, all writers, a bunch of different writers putting in their best advice. And one of them was the first seven years are the worst, which I just think <laughs> is great advice. Um, but, and then in terms of writing suspense books, since this is a, you know, a book, a, a conversation about this kind of book, I, I, I dream them out in notebooks first, map out the the plotting pretty pretty extensively before I start writing so that I know what I'm going to plant and you know what what kind of red herrings or or themes and characters I'm going to develop throughout. Uh, yeah, I would agree with with all of that. Um, I really believe especially um, it's easy to say, especially when you're starting out, but like even for me, like staying on some kind of a schedule, a writing schedule is really, really helpful, especially because things do interrupt you. So um, I teach in a couple of different programs and or, you know, this year there's I'm releasing a book, which I'm sure you feel the same kind of it becomes like its own job for like a month releasing a book. Um, so that stuff kind of interrupts what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so even if I have to take a few weeks off, I can kind of come back to it and go, okay, now, now I know what I actually, you know, how I actually like to work, which is I like to work for, you know, whatever. For me, it's, it's the, I try to make it the first thing I do. Now I'm lucky because I live so far East in North America that I can very easily turn my email off till about noon my time. Mm -hmm. And when I turn it on again, it's like, 1030 in Toronto <laughs> or New York, and I haven't really missed anything. Um, so I try to do that. Um, in terms of plotting, I do so much more of that now than I ever used to. So, um, you know, when I started writing, I wrote uh, a book of short stories. And then my first novel, I 100% thought my first novel was going to be like a coming of age novel set in Toronto in the 90s. And it ended up being a thriller. Um, because the events that actually happened in Toronto in the 90s were all about fear. And I realized that if I was going to write a story about what it was like, you know, growing up at that time for a girl, uh, that I was going to have to, to really um, come face and eyes against that fear. And the best way to do that is to make the reader feel afraid. Um, so that first novel, I really kind of like just so sort of groped my way through. And since then, have become much more uh, plotty. And the book I'm working on now, 
I have a spreadsheet and it's so relaxing <laughs> that I have a spreadsheet because uh, no matter how many interruptions I have, you know, again, I've had to take a few weeks off. This week I got to sit down and come back to the novel and I'm like, what do I need to write again? Oh yeah, it's right there. You know, these are the things that happen in the next chapter. So I know what to do. Um, and it's actually, it, it's, a, it's a huge relief rather than sort of just, just groping all the time. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. You know what? Every writer has a process that works for them and it can evolve, but it's all in how your mind works. Or I sometimes think superstition enters into it. If it worked for you the first time, why mess with it? Um, but, you know, this question comes up at almost every Zoom we do, and it really is interesting, the, the answers that we get. And, and it doesn't really transfer for those of you who ask the question, you know, um, just because it goes that way for Elizabeth or that way for Maria doesn't mean it's going to go that way for you. You have to find your own, um, your own process. Is that it, Patrick? And there are also some some really interesting, very unconventional approaches. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, you know, Diana Gabaldon has this elaborate, strange thing where she she writes from, you know, midnight to four in the morning and then and she still sticks to that. That's why there's so many sex scenes in her books. Probably. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll mention that to her. She does do late night sex scene readings, you know, but she also writes in scenes. And then what takes her forever is to write the connecting, the bridges between the scenes. She writes a scene, then she writes a scene, then she writes a scene over here and a scene over there. And at some point, she has to connect them all together. Um, we were talking about this last night. I've known at least one author who starts in the middle of the story. We know people who, you know, I'm serious, you know? And a question, I mean, I've, I've edited probably 800 and some books by now. And one of the things I know is that oftentimes when you get a rough draft, where the story starts is not where the author started it. It might be chapter three, or you need to take a few things and put them together. So, you know, books are, Readers don't always realize books are an evolutionary process until they roll on the press. Up until that moment, yeah. you know, a book can can is malleable. It can change. It can various things can happen to it and to stories. And you know, some books take years to write, and some books are. Remember the late Robert Barnard, who was one of my favorite authors, British author, incredibly clever plotter and all. And he went, wrote this one book. I had the most absurd ending i mean it's just like out of the blue it was like pirates or something appeared, you know from nowhere and i said to him what the, what's that robert and he said well he said my deadline was there and i just couldn't figure it out <laughs> you know, so so that's an example he's dead so i can say that without embarrassing him you know i mean they're two star books that that don't have any logical explanation for how they worked out it was like I needed pirates, you know, because I only had two days to run it. So who knows? Anyway, it's really been a joy to talk to both of you. What a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who've been watching or will watch, um, there's a podcast available tomorrow that you can recommend to friends or the Facebook video will live forever. And Patrick is holding up copies of the books. So because, <clears throat> excuse me, Maria's in Canada. And no, wrong one. <laughs> Catherine's in Canada. <clears throat> Maria was more in reach. Um, we don't actually have, as we often do, autograph copies, but now the Canadian border is open again. Um, <laughs> you know, we may be able to achieve that with a, with a different book. So thank you very much, ladies, for joining us. And we wish all of you a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>